Okay, so there's no real need to beat around the bush. You and I both know what an iceberg video is and what it is supposed to do. So let's do ourselves a favor and skip those formalities. The iceberg image I'll be covering today is one that I designed myself, but it adapts a lot of information I found from other icebergs online made by these users. The only disclaimer I really want to make here is that if you haven't ever played the Xenoblade series, I highly recommend you stop watching here. This video has spoilers for all three of the games in the DLC stories, and I don't want to ruin the series for anyone if I don't have to. Seriously, Xenoblade Chronicles is one of the most brilliant games I've ever had the privilege to play, and its story is one that is best experienced blind. The same goes for the other games. I can't tell you what to do, but if you don't heed my advice, you'll just be depriving yourself of an amazing experience that you could have had firsthand, And that's just really sad. So, now that that's taken care of, let's dive into the Xenoblade Chronicles iceberg. I'm really feeling it. This is a pretty obvious one. The line, I'm really feeling it, is a common battle line for Shulken Xenoblade Chronicles. Believe me, if you've played the game, you've heard him say it several times. This line specifically became a huge meme in the summer of 2014, when Shulk was revealed as a newcomer in Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS. After he backslashes Bowser, the music starts and he says the iconic line. This was the first impression Shulk left on a lot of people, and this Smash reveal did a lot of good for Xenoblade's growth as a franchise. For a while, Shulk was basically known as the I'm really feeling it guy for people who weren't familiar with the game. The whole bit has definitely faded as time has passed, but it's certainly a big part of the Xenoblade and Nintendo canon. Races in Xenoblade This is likely referring to the many species and peoples that inhabit the worlds of the Xenoblade games. In the first one, the four main races are the Homs, Nopon, Hyentia, and Machina. In X, well, there's humans, along with like a dozen others. Interestingly, Nopon also exists in X and are natives to the planet of Mira. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 also has distinct races, but they're more similar in this one than any other. We do have Nopon once again, but most of the others are all pretty similar and fit comfortably under the umbrella as humanoids. There are differences, like Gormati being cat people and Orion's having, uh, scales or something on their face, but overall their differences are much less aesthetically and narratively pronounced than the differences between the races in Xenoblade 1. Gower Plain Gower Plain is a location on the Bionis' leg in Xenoblade Chronicles 1. It's pretty much the first incredibly large free roam area you explore in the game. It's incredibly iconic, given that it's on the front cover of the box art, and it appears as a stage in Super Smash Bros. Interestingly, the music that plays for the Bionis' leg as a whole is titled Gower Plain. Because of that, I think a lot of people use the term Gower Plain interchangeably with the term Bionis' leg, even if it's not exactly accurate. British Accents This one is pretty easy. One of the most notable things about the Xenoblade Chronicles English dub is that the entire cast is voiced by British voice actors. This was done because the game was originally just dubbed in English for Europe, and there were originally no plans for a North American release. But eventually, Xenoblade Chronicles was brought to the Americas, but they didn't bother to change the games much from the European release. If you're American and have ever wondered why many things in the games are spelled the British way instead of the American way, that's why. Honestly, I really like the British cast for many reasons. One reason is that the actors chosen were pretty unknown when they were cast for Xenoblade, and because of that, it was probably the first time most of us heard their voices. I tend to get fatigued with a lot of American anime dubs because you often encounter a lot of the same actors over and over, so it's nice to have a totally unique cast. That's just my opinion, though. But because of the complicated localization for the first game, it's kind of become a tradition for Xenoblade games to cast British VAs. Sort of. Xenoblade X didn't do it, but that makes sense given that most of the human characters literally are from the United States. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 brought in a mix of voices from a few countries, but interestingly the Blade actors were directed to use American accents regardless of their place of birth. Also, this is just a side note, but it's kind of interesting that even in the American release for Xenoblade Definitive Edition, they still kept all the British spellings in the script. I like that. Operation Rainfall Operation Rainfall was a video game fan campaign calling for the release of three region-exclusive Wii games in North America. These three titles were The Last Story, Pandora's Tower, and Xenoblade Chronicles. Xenoblade Chronicles was released in Europe in the summer of 2011, but there had been no confirmed plans to release the game in North America at the time. Because of this, gamers all over America made their desire to play Xenoblade known online, and their voice was eventually heard. Kind of. Debatably. Nintendo would acknowledge the online demand for the game. But in one interview, Reggie fils claimed the release wasn't directly because of the fan demand, and that was only one of many reasons. It's a bit shaky, especially because it's not clear what is totally true and what is just business speak. Still though, Operation Rainfall is seen today as a big success as far as fan video game campaigns go. 
Xenoblade 2 Blade Cameos Of all the blades you can use in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, there are a few who are characters from other Xeno games. In the base game, there was Cosmos, who was a major character from the Xeno Saga games. And once they started adding DLC to the game, you gained the ability to fight with a few more. You have Telos, who is also from the Xeno Saga games. You also have Shulken Fiora from the first Xenoblade. And finally, you have Elma from X. The cameos for the other protagonists aren't canon, or at least that's how most fans feel, but you still get to see Rex and Shulk talk to each other, and that's pretty fun. Ricky is a father. This is pretty much known by everyone who's played the first game. Because of the fact that he is a Nopon, it is difficult to accurately guess how old Ricky is supposed to be for a lot of people. But if you play the game, you'll find out that the guy is 40 years old and has 11 children. It's kind of played off as a joke at first, but later on in the game it's actually revealed that Ricky is a pretty wise person, and his experience as a father has taught him a lot. And hey, it's quite fun knowing that Ricky is the only main party member in Xenoblade 1 who is confirmed to have had sex. In Future Connected, they actually expanded the role of Ricky's family quite a lot. Most notably, they put two of Ricky's kids into the spotlight as playable characters, Kino and Nene. The music is beloved. Xenoblade Chronicles has amassed quite a reputation for its music. I distinctly remember falling in love with tracks like You Will Know Our Names and Mechanical Rhythm before I'd ever even play the game, and that definitely increased my interest in giving the series a try. I think most of my favorite stuff from the series comes from Ace Plus, as they are responsible for tracks like Engage the Enemy and Makana's Field, which are both fantastic. Tora is an otaku. Tora is pretty clearly a bit of a nerd and a recluse, and fits pretty comfortably into the Japanese definition of otaku, a young person who is obsessed with computers or particular aspects of popular culture to the detriment of their social skills. Although anime doesn't seem to exist within the world of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Tora very much exhibits a lot of the weird stereotypes people tend to have of big anime fans. The way he programmed Poppy is pretty creepy at some points, and there's plenty of jokes surrounding it throughout the game. However, it seems that Tora comes from a long line of reclusive maid fetishists, given that he, his father, and his grandfather all worked on the artificial blades and displayed an interest in dressing them up in bunny costumes and French maid outfits. He even has an alternate DLC outfit called Best Girl, where he wears a stretched out t-shirt of Pyra. Screaming this is basically just referring to the large amount of yelling and screaming you get to enjoy when playing games from the Xenoblade Chronicles series, especially during the most dramatic cutscenes. Rex and Shulk especially yell and scream so much that it's kind of become a meme. I have to give special props to the voice of Shulk, Adam Howden, who is basically my homie, even though he and I have never met. When doing his performance of the character, he would listen to the Japanese audio lines, especially the dramatic ones, in order to emulate the attitude and stylings of the original voice for Shulk to a T. And that really seems to have contributed to his phenomenal performance in the game. Foresight Foresight refers to Mithra's ability to predict future events in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. It's quite like Shulk's visions, although it doesn't really work exactly the same in the story, and definitely not in gameplay. Shulk would see glimpses of the future and its consequences, while it seems Mithra gives real-time predictions of enemies' movements. It generally appears to work much more in the immediate moment than Visions, which have a much longer range temporally. Territorial Rotbart This refers to an infamous unique monster that appears in the starting areas of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2. Xenoblade has the habit of scattering a few enemies around the in-game areas that are way higher in level than the rest, and for many people the Territorial Rotbart is the first of its kind you'll come across and likely die to especially because of how much he roams around in the first game. Although it's definitely annoying to just get sniped by him out of nowhere, that makes it all the more satisfying when you finally can beat him later on in the game without any issue. Like really, it's almost a rite of passage to go back to the early areas and finally kill him. It's debatably more satisfying than killing Zanza. Chugga Conroy Chugga Conroy is someone you've probably heard of, but if you haven't, he's a longtime beloved Let's Player on YouTube who's been making consistent uploads since 2008. The reason he's on this list is the fact that he's made two very popular Let's Plays for each of the main Xenoblade games. The first one especially was a big deal among the Xenoblade fans I knew when it first came out for its high quality and level of thoroughness, especially because this was a point in time where there wasn't really that much seriously high quality content focused on the series, or at this point in time, the game. Thank you for that, Chugga. How Visions Work it's revealed in Xenoblade Chronicles that the way the Bonato can grant visions is because it can predict the movements of every single existing particle of ether, which in the game's universe is the fundamental building block of all matter. So on a large scale, the Bonato can predict future events with decent accuracy. It's only an approximation though, and with some willpower, these predicted events can be counteracted. 
I really like this explanation, and I appreciate how it tries to give a sound theoretical basis for how the prediction of the future can work in the game's environment, especially because it fits right in with the themes of fate and determination in the game. Mithra's Cooking An occasional joke brought up between Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and the Torna DLC is that Mithra is a terrible cook. However, she loves cooking and insists on doing it when she can, much to the dismay of the people around her. Ironically enough, Pyra is an excellent cook, which begs the question, how good is Numa at cooking? Did she inherit Mithra's lack of skill, or does she cook as well as Pyra? I like to imagine she gets the best of both worlds, combining Mithra's enthusiasm with Pyra's skill, but that's just my headcanon. Dahlia Controversy This refers to the mixed reception that the character Dahlia got upon the initial release of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Her design certainly wasn't well liked by everyone, and it struck a lot of arguments surrounding the costume designs of female characters in Xenoblade 2 and video games in general. It's a tale as old as time itself. Ironically enough, it was later revealed that the character designer for Dahlia was a woman herself, which just made the whole argument even weirder. I'm really glad all of this is over. Anel Anel is a YouTuber who primarily makes Xeno-related content, and he's one of my personal favorites of that bunch. I really enjoy his tutorials on how to take advantage of the mechanics of individual Xenoblade installments to get better at the games, especially the ones for Xenoblade 2. Also, at the time of writing this, he currently is the world record holder for the any% percent speedrun of Xenoblade 2, so it's pretty fair to say he knows his stuff. Project Cross Zone 2 I actually talked about this in my Ace Attorney Iceberg video. Project Cross Zone 2 is a crossover tactical RPG game that features characters from all sorts of series. One of these series is the Xeno series, and you get to play as Cosmos from Xenosaga and Fiora from Xenoblade 1 specifically. This was a pretty big deal at the time, as it was one of the first overt connections between properties from the older and newer Xeno games. This was a few years before Cosmos and Telos made their way into Xenoblade 2, so it was pretty exciting. Lin's Hair Clips Fun fact, if you look closely at Lin's hair in Xenoblade Chronicles X, you'll notice that her hair clips look just like the Monado. It's unclear whether this is supposed to be an in-story connection to Xenoblade Chronicles or not. If I had to guess personally, I'd predict that the hair clip designs are just an external nod by the developers and aren't meant to be direct evidence of a story connection between the two games. Sakurai likes Pyra better. In the official Super Smash Bros. Ultimate presentation for Pyra and Mithra, developer Masahiro Sakurai says he prefers playing as Pyra in-game strictly for her combat mechanics. However, he stumbles over his words a little bit in a funny way, kind of implying that he might have, uh, more complex motives for his preference, probably involving her haircut. Or her leggings. Monado Rex The Monado Rex, or Monado Replica X, is the main weapon used by Shulk in Xenoblade Chronicles Future Connected. It has the exact same stats as the Replica Monado from the main game, but it has a different design and name. It also can't use Monado Enchant, but you don't really need it anyway. What's interesting about it to a lot of people is how the shortened version of its name is Monado Rex, and Rex is the name of the main protagonist of Xenoblade 2. A decent amount of discussion comes from this, especially with some of the story implications of Future Connected and other Xeno games. Could the Monado Rex have a direct story connection to the Rex we know and love? I mean, I doubt it, and I think this is just another external nod like Lin's hair clips. The Xenoblade games have a track record of reusing character names and stuff in this kind of way, after all, but who knows. Memory Space This refers to a recurring area of Xenoblade Chronicles that is essentially a manifestation of Zanza's memories. Earlier on in the game, it just appears to be an indiscriminate night sky, but at the end of the game right before you face Zanza, you travel through it and pass by several of the planets in our solar system. It's one of the first overt hints to the idea that the world of Xenoblade has a direct connection to our own world, and once you've killed Zanza, it's revealed that the entire world of Bionis and Mechanis was created in a freak accident phase transition experiment that took place on a low orbit space station, and the two scientists who were there when it happened became the Bionis and Mechanis. The planets you saw on the way to seeing him was his memory of the world surrounding his home planet. I'll never forget the pure euphoria I felt when I experienced this plot twist firsthand. It was such an exciting revelation, and it blew my 13-year-old mind. Monado, Beginning of the World This refers to the original name Xenoblade Chronicles had before it became Xenoblade Chronicles. It was first shown off with this title at E3 2009, and the game was certainly in a different state at that point. A lot of the characters look pretty similar to their final form, with the major exception of Fiora, who looks completely different. Bad Character Design This most likely refers to the criticism Xenoblade Chronicles 2 received for a lot of its art direction. We talked about the whole Dahlia debacle already, but even besides that, the game did receive some flack for the, uh, lack of consistency in its character designs. I mean, whatever you think about it, I'm sure that most people would agree that these two characters do not look like they come from the same video game. I don't really want to weigh in on this more than necessary, but that's the gist of it. Adam is married. 
This is a detail about Adam that is surprisingly hard to come across, but during the events of Torn of the Golden Country, Adam is married and has a pregnant wife. For whatever reason, it's only mentioned in the middle of a side quest chain that a lot of players likely missed out on. It's kind of a shame too, because I think it provides a bit of useful context about Adam and Mithra's relationship that the main story could have benefited from. Rex Outfit in Breath of the Wild Update 1.3.3 of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild introduced a new armor set for Link inspired by Rex's outfit in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. That's basically all there is to say. I guess it's worth mentioning that you also get a Swim Dash stamina boost. Colonies 1 through 5, 7, and 8 were destroyed. In Xenoblade Chronicles, especially near the beginning, it's made pretty clear that the Homs are on the brink of extinction. The first location of the game is Colony 9, one of the two only surviving colonies left. And during the game, the only other colony, Colony 6, is burnt to the ground. It's made pretty clear that all the other ones were destroyed. It's also revealed in a certain heart-to-heart -heart that Mumkar was from one of these destroyed colonies. I guess that might be one reason he didn't care much about betraying the other Homs. Alvis is Ontos. This is a theory that, well, it's not even really a theory. It's pretty much established that Alvis is the missing Trinity processor core that triggered a quote-unquote space-time transition event and disappeared from the universe of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. The core's name was Ontos, and it went on to shape the universe of the first game. Basically, Alvis is an Aegis, like Malos and Mithra. There's even more evidence of this in the definitive version of Xenoblade Chronicles, which I will go over later. No official art for spoilers. One sort of frustrating thing about Xenoblade Chronicles and its sequels is that it is very light on the official art. There's usually art just for the playable characters, and maybe a handful of side characters, but there is not much official art ever made for characters that show up past any of the game's halfway points. Like, I'm sure fellow YouTubers will know the struggle of trying to find good visual aid material for a video game character and basically having to choose from a bunch of cutscene screenshots. This has to be done a lot in Xenoblade. I suppose it makes sense though, especially because of the fact that a lot of the official renders are primarily commissioned to be used in promotional material, and spoiler characters like Zanza are obviously not going to be shown in any advertisements for the game. It's frustrating sometimes, but understandable. Monado Side Effects The Monado is a legendary weapon, but using it takes a heavy toll on its wielder if they are not Zanza or have Zanza in them. Shulk was able to use it because Zanza was living inside of him, and Zanza never resisted until later on when Shulk began to go against Zanza's wishes. But characters like Dunban were able to wield the Monado with their intense physical strength and determination, and because of that they were able to keep it from going totally all over the place. But they couldn't unlock its full potential and it did cause damage over time. Eventually, after the Battle of Sword Valley, Dunban lost almost entire control of his arm. Interestingly, it's revealed in the Xenoblade Monado archives that Mumkar was also able to wield the Monado to some extent, but Dunban was given the honor instead. This caused Mumkar to resent Dunban and eventually betray him. Xenoblade X OST Memes The soundtrack to Xenoblade Chronicles X is pretty great. There are tons of absolutely fantastic songs to enjoy. Though, I have to admit that the songs with lyrics are kind of silly a lot of the time. The majority of the songs are in English, but I would predict the songs are written much more with an audience in mind who don't actually know the language. At best, the lyrics are just kind of generic and hollow, but at worst, they are fucking hilarious. I think the most infamous example is Black Tar. The new Los Angeles night theme tries to kind of do a hip-hop sort of thing, but instead of having any rapping or lyrics, it's literally just a bunch of guys grunting and yelling, YEAH! I'll never forget how funny I thought this was when I first heard it, and the memes some people made are excellent. Go! All in all, the English lyrics and weird design choices can be a bit silly, but honestly, I wouldn't get rid of them if I could. They kind of give the game a certain charm, and I definitely grew to love them. Even the uhs and yeahs! Think you can take me? When Xenoblade Chronicles 2 was first released, players who were coming upon Chapter 2 had their eardrums violated with constantly repeating voice lines by Ardanian soldiers. For whatever reason, the soldiers would say their lines over and over endlessly. Think you can take me? 
Thank you can take me! Don't you can take me! Thank you can take me! Like, games like Xenoblade often become victim to repeating voice lines over time, but this was on a whole new level, and players could not get enough when it came to memeing about it. It was so bad that the next patch of the game literally removed the lines because it was so made fun of. Unfortunately, the fan petition to bring them back was never listened to. At least they made a joke about it in the challenge mode. First Low Orbit Station This refers to the space station that resides at the top of the world tree in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Also known as Radamanthus, it was one of three space elevators built around the Earth to study the conduit in a less potentially hazardous way. It's also the place where Klaus used the conduit to create a new universe, causing the whole dimension split that led to the creation of the worlds of both Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2. You can visit it at the end of Xenoblade 2, and my god is it such an awesome place for the game to finish. It's eerie, dark, and nearly lifeless, basically the opposite of what the characters actually expected to see at the top of the world tree, and I really like it for that. Telethia on Mira One interesting bit of knowledge about Xenoblade Chronicles X is that the planet Mira has Telethia. In fact, the strongest tyrant enemy in the entire game is a huge Telethia that is level 99. This begs the question, what are Telethia doing on Mira? Is there a connection we're not aware of? The Telethia and Xenoblade 1 are an ancient species meant to wipe out all life onto the Bionis for Zanza. We don't know if the Mira version serves any specific purpose like that, but it is interesting that it seems to be peaceful to humans. Perhaps that's a hint to something. There are fan theories potentially linking the Mira Telethia to the Bionis Telethia, but for the time being, we don't actually know for sure if there's actually supposed to be a story link. It could very well be the same kind of situation as Nopon or Lin's hair clips, more of an external nod to a repeating motif than anything to write. Alvis's Necklace I hinted at this earlier in the Anto spit. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition was all things considered a very faithful remake, but there was one notable character design change of interest. Alvis's Necklace. In the original release, he had a key thing hanging from it, but that was replaced with a certain gem that looks remarkably familiar. Uh, oh yeah, it's the same exact design as the Aegis Core Crystals. If you for whatever reason still had any doubt about Alvis being Ontos, that alone is really damning evidence of the connection. Skell Fanfiction This refers to an infamous cutscene from Xenoblade X where Lin starts geeking out at the presence of Skells. The scene serves as a formal introduction to the story and gameplay mechanic, and has been poked fun at for some of the weird dialogue. Oh yeah, work it baby! Mm -mm. The most heavily memed part is the line where Lin tries to show the player character her quote-unquote Skell fanfiction. Something about that line just seems kind of silly. It's not particularly strange that a character would really like something like Skells, but the term fanfiction is just confusing here. Skells are a weapon and vehicle in the game. They're not like something from a video game or anime. It's like a car enthusiast in our world saying he writes car fanfiction. It just doesn't make much sense. And because of that, the line has become something of a meme. Chests in Xenoblade When data miners and hackers accessed the unused Bionis shoulder map in the original Wii release of Xenoblade Chronicles, they were given some insight into some gameplay mechanics that didn't make it into the final game. The most notable example is the fact that treasure chests used to be normally found throughout the map. Now, Xenoblade Chronicles did end up having a few chests and things like giants and Hyantia ruins in the final game, but the ones here were just normal looking chests scattered throughout the map. Interesting. Giants the Giants are an extinct race of Bionis that lived long before the main events of Xenoblade. Like Hyantia, they were created by granting intelligence to Telethia, and their ruins can be found all over the Bionis. You can explore some of these ruins in side quests, too. Although the species is extinct, you do get to see a couple of Giants firsthand. The first one you see is Arglas, but at that point in time, he had been possessed by Zanza for at least thousands of years. You can also learn late game that Dixon is not actually a Homs. He was born a Giant and can just change forms. He was granted immortality in exchange for eternal loyalty to Zanza, and because of that you also end up having to fight against him. Sad. All stories happen at the same time. So, it's confirmed that Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and 2 take place at the same point in time. There are plenty of hints at it, but at the end of the second game they literally played the soundbite of Shulk giving a speech before killing Zanza. This basically confirms that the final battle of both games takes place at more or less the same time. I mean, the whole reason the Architect died in the 2 dimension is that Shulk and friends killed his other half in the 1 dimension, so the games kinda have to align. The word all here does stick out a bit, given we don't know what place Xenoblade X has in this if it has a place at all. So for the time being, Xenoblade 1 and 2 are aligned, but we don't know where X fits in. Elysium is a resort. 
So, at the end of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it is revealed that the so-called Elysium you've been heading towards this entire time is nothing but a deserted wasteland with no signs of life. It was quite disappointing. For pretty much the entire game, you've only had Elysium described to you in the abstract, and you don't really have any idea of what it is besides a grassy paradise with a lot of space for people to live. But what Elysium actually was, was a residential area for scientists working at Radamanthus along with their families. It was presumably designed to simulate an Earth-like environment as a remedy to the physical and psychological tolls of living in a space station. But, once Klaus did what he did, the people who worked on the station all disappeared. I don't know if resort would be the right word to describe Elysium, but it is definitely close in the sense that it acts as a sort of escape. Alvis's Claymore is a recolored junk sword. I never actually noticed this until recently. I guess it may be because Alvis only fights in your party once and you never can even play as him, but the claymore he uses is literally just a recolored version of the junk sword Shulk uses at the beginning of the game. The Black Wreckage is Mumkar's Remains One of the landmarks on the Fallen Arm in Xenoblade Chronicles is the Black Wreckage, and if you take a look at it, you can see pretty clearly that it is the remains of Metal Face after the death of Mumkar. This can go over a lot of first-time players' heads, as it kind of blends in with a lot of the other Metcon armor scraps littered throughout the area. A lot of people might not really notice from a cursory glance, though I'm sure there are plenty of people watching this right now telling me that they actually knew from the first time they got to the area. If that's the case, good for you, I guess. One interesting fact is that the reason it's called the Black Wreckage is that the literal translation of Metal Face's name from Japanese is Blackface. But due to the, uh, cultural stigma surrounding that term, the Mechon's name was changed. However, when translators were localizing place names, they likely either didn't realize what the Black Wreckage was referring to, or they just didn't care enough to change the name. Nopon Dialect Grammar Now, anyone who's played even a little bit of any Xenoblade game is aware that Nopon have a very different dialect than all the other species in the game. This includes speaking of oneself in the third person, the lack of consistent verb tense usage, and the swapping out of words. But the dialect actually goes pretty far in some interesting areas. One line that always stuck with me was when Shulk asks Ricky how old he is and Ricky replies by saying, Ricky have 40 years. What's interesting about that is that it's basically a totally different way of saying his age than the way most English speakers would. Now, if you speak a romantic language, or even if you took high school Spanish or French, you would know that the way people express their age in those languages is not by saying they're a certain amount of years old. They do so by saying that they have a certain amount of years. And Ricky essentially does that, as if he were directly translating from one of those languages. Maybe this is just my inner linguistics nerd speaking, but I always found the fact that they made that decision when writing Nopon and Xenoblade to be really interesting and creative. Duncan in Rain It just feels great to be back with Xenoblade Chronicles' memorable cast of characters, whether it's the lovable meathead Rain or the stoic and inscrutable Duncan. How do you even make that mistake? What the hell? When I first heard of this, I assumed it was a mistake made in the original Xenoblade review from 2012. But no, it was made in a professional IGN review in 2020. Like, how does that happen? Did the guy even play the game? Like, all around, the article seems like it was written by someone who knows what happened in the story, so how did the guy read the characters' names wrong? I always assumed the article's writer is the person who reads it for the video, but maybe I was wrong. I mean, the review isn't even that bad otherwise, except for some Melia dissing I have to stand against, and there's also footage of Mechon Fior, which is basically a mortal sin to me as a Xenoblade fan. But, whatever. Ancient Daedala is stronger than Yaldabaoth. This one is pretty simple. When Egil as a character is first introduced, he claims his Mechon, Yaldabaoth, is the strongest one ever built. This is put into question outside of the main story if you fight Ancient Daedala, one of the game's super bosses, who's over 30 levels higher than Yaldabaoth in game. This has led to a lot of memes and a few fan theories for how Daedala fits into the whole equation involving Mechon. But I personally believe that Daedala sort of exists outside of the core canon of the game and was probably added to Fallen Arm way after the story was written. Though, I don't know for sure. Melancholy Tyrea is the only voiced side quest. One of the most interesting anomalies in Xenoblade Chronicles is the existence of the Melancholy Tyrea side quest. Now, story-wise, it's fine. It gives some insight into Tyrea as a character and her relationship with Melia. But for some reason, it has cutscenes and voice acting. You might not remember this, but there is not a single other side quest in Xenoblade 1 that has this kind of stuff. Those only really exist in X and 2. So Melancholy Tyrea really sticks out for this reason, and for years fans have been wondering why it has this kind of special treatment in the first place. Personally, I think it was done to fit some important plot resolution to the game without disrupting the main story. I wouldn't be surprised if the original plan was to have the side quest narrative somewhere in the main plot. However, the story had to be cut due to the fact that it was hard to find a good time for it. It would make sense, given it has all this special treatment. 
and one of the developer's biggest regrets with Xenoblade was the lack of closure for Melia as a character. And Future Connected, which exists partially to give further screen time to Melia, also has Tyrea in it playing a major role. It has Teelan too, which is cool. Given he went from being just another Affinity Chart side quest NPC to having a proper model and voice. Also, fun fact, we learned during this side quest that High NT are able to fly. Blade Sex Trafficking In Chapter 9 of Xenoblade 2, there is a flashback to a conversation between Zeke and Amalthus about a confrontation Zeke had with bandits. He brought up how they may have wanted to kill him to take and sell Pandora's core crystal, and how she likely would have sold for a lot because she's both humanoid and pretty attractive. Apparently, there are markets that line up core crystals with quote-unquote pretty pictures of the blades inside. A lot of fans interpret this scene as a hint at the existence of blade trafficking for, uh, certain purposes, but it's not a total 100% confirmation. Though I certainly would say in my opinion I think that's what they're implying. Also, in the Japanese version of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, there is a joke about Pyra potentially working as a prostitute to raise money, which kind of eludes this specific point, but is still tangentially related. Desiree is Zord's daughter. Zord is one of the first faced mech on you encounter, but interestingly he's the only major story one that doesn't even have his face and identity revealed. Well, sort of. After you defeat him in the Aether Mind, there's a special line with the side quest NPC Desiree that she had a father who worked as a blacksmith whose name was Zord, and apparently, he died during the Battle of Sword Valley. So, he, much like Mumkar, was likely taken by Mechon and forced to become a face Mechon pilot. Galea is the Infernal Goldo. There's a boss in Xenoblade Chronicles 2 that you encounter in the land of Moritha named the Infernal Goldo. Goldos are humanoid monsters that came from humans left on Earth after Klaus split the universe, and amidst the ruin, they fuse themselves with core crystals in an attempt to achieve immortality. What's interesting about this one in particular is that after you defeat it, Rex comes across an ID card near its body where you can vaguely see a familiar face, Galea, or Lady Mayneth, or the person who tried to stop Klaus when he was trying to use the conduit. What we can infer from this is that Klaus and Galea both experience a split. One half of them became Zanza and Mayneth, and the other half became the Architect and the Goldo. Nia's Original Design Like basically every character, Nia went through a few phases of development. Here you can see Nia's beta design, along with some early sketches of Pandoria. And, um, Nia kind of reminds me of someone. Oh. L's Real Name The real name of L is actually never revealed in either the Death Note manga or anime, but in some other adaptations, his name is revealed to be... Wait. Oh, that L! Okay, L's real name is, uh, El Sirofe. I don't know how to pronounce that. Sorry. Interestingly, that name is an anagram of Lucifer, which is ironic because the character is really nice and funny. Loading Screen Symbols Xenoblade Chronicles honestly has a really good looking loading screen. It's simple, but the Monado in the corner is really cool looking. And interestingly, the symbol written on the Monado here is the kanji for reading. Cool. Machine, Man, God Speaking of Monado symbols, there are a few cool details snuck into the game regarding those. First of all, the symbol for Monado Enchant is the kanji for machine, which makes sense given that Monado Enchant grants the party the ability to damage Mechon with any weapon. But it gets cooler. Remember the cutscene where Shulk unlocks the Monado too? Yeah, well, in that scene, the symbol that appears on the sword is the kanji for man, which makes sense given that the Monado 2 gains the ability to hurt people, and by extension, face mech on. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Right before you finally kill Zanza, another symbol appears on the Monado, and it's the kanji for god. I guess this isn't as much of a secret if you know your kanji, but if you don't know the language like myself, this can go over your head for years. Alvis and HAL 9000 as we know, Alvis at his core is a data processing robot machine thing, and although it's not clearly stated until the end of the game, there are hints at it as early as his first appearance. In the battle against the Telethia, he has a couple of sci-fi references in his battle voice lines. He has the chance to say, Resistance is futile, which is a Star Trek reference, and you can also give the iconic HAL 9000 line, I'm afraid I can't let you do that, which is a fun reference in Easter Egg. The Bionis' shoulder was never cut. This is referring to the fact that people believe that the Bionis' shoulder at one point in Xenoblade Chronicles development was meant to be visited in the main story. Shaka Conroy partially popularized this theory by talking about it in his Let's Play, and bringing up how the transition from Frontier Village to Air the Sea seemed to be kind of weird and rushed. So for years, people believed that the map was meant to be visited in the story and had to be written out, but 
Nope. Takahashi has stated in multiple interviews that the area was just a beta map used to test the general feel of the game, and there were no serious plans to fit it into the main story. Gnostic Influences If you don't know what Gnosticism is, well, don't fret, because I barely know what it is either and I did research on it for this video. It was essentially a large-scale religious and intellectual movement that sought to ponder the mysteries of life, divinity, human existence, and more. And Tetsuya Takahashi loves his Gnosticism, and there are influences all over his work. I mean, the monado itself is a reference. The term monad is a common concept found in Gnosticism and it refers to the One, or the Absolute. A supreme being, basically. The Mekon Yaldabaoth is literally just named after the Gnostic Demiurge, which is the concept of a false god. I don't want to go too deep with this, as I am in no way knowledgeable about this concept. Just take my word for it. The Lifehold Core was destroyed. The Lifehold Core is a super important plot device throughout all of Xenoblade X that has all the genetic data for all life on Earth. It also harbors the consciousness of all the human characters, which is why everyone is frantically looking for it throughout the game. But it turns out that this entire time, the database had been destroyed. But for some reason, everyone's mimeosomes were still working. We don't know why or how that's possible. Elma thinks it's something about the planet. How Wars Profit Napon In Xenoblade Chronicles 2, there is a pouch item book purchasable in War Ordain called How Wars Profit Napon. And, uh, well, it kind of leans into a depiction of Napon in-game some people seem to notice. Uh, you see, well, uh, there's a chance that this video may be seen by a lot of people, so I'm going to choose my words carefully. Or, better yet, I'll read a post I found from a thread discussing the issue. When I played Xenoblade Chronicles, I didn't have a negative impression of Napon. I didn't feel like they were stereotyped in a negative light or like they possessed some sort of bad seed in their hearts waiting to be cultivated by tempting vices. I've been playing too for about 60 hours now. I'm not a big fan of Napon in this game, Tor in particular. But I can't help but notice how all the game's negative stereotypes regarding Napon and their betrayal mirror real-world stereotypes of a certain ethno-religious group. I don't really want to make people mad here, so I'm just going to move on, but I guess I'll say that this pouch item kind of raised a few eyebrows. In my head, there are two versions of me. My god, I love this game. Xenoblade Chronicles is a game that excels in its foreshadowing, and I think this might just be the best example. In my head... There are two versions of me. One of them is saying that. It's telling me, listen to what Dunban said. What about the other one? It keeps shouting, make them pay. Destroy every single one of them. And it won't stop getting louder. That doesn't sound like you. Sure, it ain't my voice in there. Might be. It's a bit of a loud mouth. If you don't get what this is referencing, just think about the cutscene where Shulk is about to kill Egil, and you can hear echoes of Zanza's voice encouraging Shulk to kill him. That's the same exact voice, and this was being hinted at within the first few hours of the game. And it's such a well-disguised line too. It fits right in with the conversation and doesn't really make you suspicious. And it's even funnier because the two literally joke about the voice being a separate entity, which it is. Mithra's Multiple Personality Disorder Oh boy, I get to talk about mental illness again. Yay! So, uh, yeah, I think we can all agree that Torn of the Golden Country ends in tragedy. With the death of multiple major characters along with the destruction of an entire continent, the cast is left with a lot of baggage to carry, especially Mithra, because she kind of caused it all. I mean, she stopped Malos and everything, but there was a lot of collateral damage and seeing Milton die caused her to start screaming and begin to glow. The next time we see her, she is Pyra. So, is this dissociative identity disorder? Well, I don't want to say definitively, because I'm not a psychiatrist and I don't want to act as an authority on a very real psychological condition. But the argument is that the trauma caused by the battle caused her to create Pyra as a way to disassociate with the events that took place. One thing that is confusing though is how much of a hand Mithra consciously had in creating her. In the main game, Mithra describes Pyra as a separate self she created, but the word created makes me feel like she was meticulous about it. But as you see in the ending of Torna, she does not seem to be very meticulous. I guess maybe she's lying? Or what we saw was the actual creation of Pyra? I don't know for sure. Ricky can hear ghosts. This is a very weird detail in Xenoblade 1. Ricky seems to be able to feel the presence of ghosts. It's first shown in a heart-to-heart -heart at Ase Tower. Ricky tells Dunban that he feels like there are ghosts nearby, and then Dunban tells him that Ase Tower was where a whole expedition of Homs died mysteriously. But Ricky didn't know this yet. So, 
Quite like the spirit medium in The Sopranos, he seemed to have insight into certain information he shouldn't have had by normal expectations. It's even made more clear at the end of the Larithia fight, where Melia gets a vision of her dying brother, and Ricky is able to somehow hear what Callian said to her. So this isn't even really that much of a speculative thing. Ricky just seems to be able to do this stuff. The Regeneration Chamber So, at the end of Xenoblade Chronicles, Fiora gets her old Tom's body back and everyone is happy for her. But it's never made clear in the main game what actually happened. I always assumed it was some Machina technology thing with Anata. But, a short story from the Minato archives reveals that between the events of Makana's core and the final battle, Lenata tells Shulk of a rumored ancient high end tier regeneration chamber that can give Fiora her body back. However, the process takes six months to complete. Shulk finds that after having a vision of it being opened and interestingly enough, it's actually right in the cylinder hanger from Colony 9 that you visit at the start of the game. Fiora refuses to use it immediately though because she wants to help the gang defeat Zanza, but once the world is saved she goes in and six months later she comes out all fixed up. Klaus likes anime. I believe this. He definitely seems like the nerdy type. I'd imagine him to be a big Evangelion fan. Lambert. Lambert is the name of an unused character found in the files of the Japanese release of the original Xenoblade. He has a model, a few animations, and that seems to be it. It's not clear what exactly he was supposed to be. Perhaps a cut party member or just a test character. We're not 100% sure. Interestingly, his model's file name is PC2, short for Playable Character 2, so maybe Lambert was the original Rhyme. Maybe. Xenoblade X is Xenoblade 10. This is a joke theory, and the joke is basically that the X in Xenoblade X is actually supposed to be the Roman numeral for 10. I think that whoever originally came up with his joke is a big dong on Rompa fan. Colonel Van Gar survived the Colony 9 attack. I don't know how he did it, but despite being the center of a giant explosion likely done as revenge for his needlessly harsh leadership by Mumkar, Vanguard survives the Mechon attack on Colony 9 and lives to fight both in the second battle of Sword Valley, and also is still around in the game's epilogue. I guess he's just really strong, and was able to continue carrying on his life mission of assaulting Colony 9 Defense Force members. Why did the water become salty? So, an interesting line in the epilogue of Xenoblade is Ryan displaying shock at the fact that the ocean water he fell into is salty. This tells us a couple of things. First of all, we can infer that the ocean water in Xenoblade before the recreation of the universe was likely freshwater, or at least it didn't have salt. Second of all, wherever Alvis transported them seems to have been above a body of salt water. So, what does this mean? Well, it was certainly a bigger mystery in the past than it is now, but nowadays the most common theory is that Alvis basically took the remains of the Bionis and just kind of placed it on Earth. This should also have coincided with the ending of Xenoblade 2 where the Cloud Sea dissipates and all the remaining Titans merge with the Earth. So. Ryan basically had a taste of her own seawater and was shocked at its salty taste. Shulk doesn't actually eat the sandwich. In Xenoblade 1, when Fiora makes Shulk a sandwich, you can see clearly that he doesn't actually eat it. If he was eating it, we would see bite marks develop and the sandwich slowly disappear. What we can infer from this is that Shulk doesn't actually like Fiora's food, and just pretends to eat so she doesn't feel bad. This actually makes sense, because Fiora says that he has no actual sense of taste and always says the same things to her regardless. It's because he isn't actually tasting the sandwich. No, but jokes aside, the reason we don't see the model change is that making a bunch of models of a sandwich being slowly eaten and properly animating that is needlessly expensive and resource consuming, so they just kind of make the model shove its face in it a little bit. In the story, you're supposed to just kind of look past that and accept the whole sandwich narrative. It's like that whole suspension of disbelief thing. The Ether Mind's magic ability to drain a player's motivation to play the game. This is just a joke about how the Ether Mind arc is one of the less exciting parts of the first game's story. This is due to multiple reasons. First of all, at this point in the game, you are still very weak and Mechon can be annoying to fight with their whole immunity thing. Also, the Ether Mind dungeon is really long. And likely most importantly, the story motivations really aren't as engaging as the motivations in other parts of the game. I mean, no offense to all the Juju fans, for the four of you who exist, but Juju is not really a popular character, and the constant chasing you have to do for this kind of annoying character who continuously disobeys Charlotte can be frustrating. So you spend all this time trying to fix up his mistakes, and it just isn't very interesting. Also, and this might just be for me, but I found the Zord boss fight to be really hard as a kid. Like, I was stuck on it for at least a couple of weeks, and it really wore me out. Nowadays I know what to do and I can make easy work of him, but I was really new to the game and its battle system at the time and I had a lot of trouble because of that. Every single copy of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is personalized. This is another joke, but there is a weird kernel of truth in it all. There is a randomness factor to how the game works for you. When you start a new game, you're assigned what is called the save file group, 
and that affects the probabilities of what blades you can get in the game. So some people get certain blades much earlier than others, which can change how you play the entire game. Ryan pressing the button in the High Entia Tomb foreshadows Klaus resetting the universe. You know, maybe writing this video has just given me major brain rot, but honestly, I can almost believe this. I'm pretty sure it was written as a joke, but after thinking about it, I can see the connections. Both Ryan and Klaus were overly curious and eager to learn about the world surrounding them, and because of that, they messed with forces beyond their understanding. And both of them also ended up putting the people around them in great danger. Klaus ended up essentially destroying the planet, and Ryan caused himself and all of his fellow travelers to fall into a booby trap. I mean, Xenoblade is a game with a lot of motifs, and this could very well be one. L is real. Yes, L is real in Xenoblade Chronicles X. He is a playable character of an unknown species who joins your party in Chapter 4, and one of his main gimmicks is how he often misunderstands human figures of speech for comedic effect. Whew! That was a lot of information. Thank you all so much for watching and joining me in this journey through random Xenoblade trivia. Thank you especially to all my patrons who helped make my videos possible. I don't know where I'd be without you. I'll see you all around.